Friends, welcome to Charismat Podcast. Today we have a very special guest, Kamal Ravikant, who is for me one of the brightest, smartest, deepest and happiest persons alive. I'm very impressed by how he plays and constantly win both games. The outer game, what society calls success, and the inner game, that we need to win but often forget about. Except building a few successful companies in Silicon Valley, then becoming an investor and founding a VC and many other impressive things like walking 550 miles across Spain, he wrote the bestseller book Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It, which shaped thousands of people's life, including mine and my grandmaster friend. Now I am super excited to learn more from this amazing human being and see how through taking care of our inner self, we can have better trust and life journeys. Kamal, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. It's so good to see you. Oh, well, it's an honor. And to the people listening, uh, first of all, thank you for listening. And second, Alvo and I were having a beautiful, beautiful conversation. And I'm definitely coming to Armenia to see him and eat all the great food. And we were just having a beautiful conversation. He's like, oh, we need to record this. We should start now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, here yeah. we are. I, 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 want, I want everyone to listen because when I was listening before recording to you, I was feeling like I'm getting all this when, when all many, so many people can, can do that. So I click that record. So come on, last, last week, I spent lots of time uh, with you, even when we are so far from each other now. I listened to your interviews, uh, read your books, your voice was in my mind, and I have so many questions, and there are a few types. Uh, some I am very curious, some I know, more or less the answers, but I want the listeners uh, to to hear it from you. So I want to start I want to start with being a bit egoistic and from the questions that is myself I'm very curious about. Uh, why the transformations happens when we are going so bottom to the breaking point? You have been there. Our mutual friend James had been there when he came with his daily practices. You came with your love yourself. Uh, I, I, when I became a grandmaster at 19, after two months, I went to my breaking point and then when my transformation comes so for everyone it's it's there why we don't do it when we are going down why we should hit the bottom and then we realize like no no no, we should do something look honestly i don't think we need to hit bottom you know it's just like hard-headed people like myself and you and james do it but i think you know honestly we're not taught that you know you know the classic dark night of the soul like if you look at a lot of like the great stories of the, and how stories are created, the arc of a story, you know, you go out in search of the treasure and you're faced with the demons and all that, right? Which is also like, it's just an allegory for the inner game. We don't really get to face ourselves until we are bottom because we're too busy involved in life or the pursuit or our mind is so easy to being full. But like, look, I'll tell you, for example... I ended up in a hospital bed with a doctor telling me a very good chance that I would die. And let me tell you, when you're in a hospital bed in insane pain and they're telling you a very good chance you can die, you get really honest with yourself in a way that you just don't through life. And I wish I could give that gift to people to be that honest with themselves because it transforms your life. It's about two years ago, right? Yeah, that was a few years ago, yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, it's... I don't know why most of us find it that way by get by hitting bottom, but I I think you know it is what it is. That's one of the reasons why I put my book out there, work so hard on it. So like like look, like here's what I learned. Here's how you can apply it. You don't need to get where I was, you know, to apply this to learn this. Um, and I think that's the reasons why a lot of people do. The people like James do that. You know, it's not like. I mean, my goal with that is people don't hit bottom. They they understand what to do with their inner self, and they do it. And you, when I'm really working myself there, I it's it's beautiful. So it's a great question, but you're asking like the fundamental human question, like why aren't we more just in touch with our our truth, our truth? You know, and uh, we're we're the best liars to ourselves. 
You know, we can really like, I mean, we talk about bullshitters. We're the best bull, uh, bullshitters to ourselves, right? And I think sometimes you have to end up in a situation where all of your walls and your bullshit is stripped away and you got to face yourself. And that's often what bottom does. And it's a very human thing, man, through, through every culture, through every, um, through generations, you know, you can go far back. And in storytelling, you see that all the time. You know, it's a very, very human thing. And I've come to realize, look, it is what it is. But my job as a human being is that if I have, I'm talented as a writer and I, I've learned this. So my job is to share it so others don't have to reach that point. You know, so I don't think we have to, but we have to open ourselves and we have to apply it. You know, this doesn't happen. Uh, this doesn't happen on its own. You know, it's like, I think there's a great, there's an Oprah Winfrey quote. Uh, she was saying, like, when life tries to tell you something, you don't listen. It speaks a little louder. And you don't listen. It speaks a little louder. You don't listen. And then it smacks the shit out of you. <laughs> you know? And you listen. <laughs> you know? She said it, 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 it about fooling ourselves. It reminded me of Richard Feynman's quote uh, when he said, we should not fool. And the easiest person to fool is ourselves. Was that Feynman? No, who Richard, was it? Not, it was not Richard Feynman. No, who was it? I thought it was Rich, Richard Feynman. Man, that's amazing. That's um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Feynman. So, um, I mean, it sounds like him, and it really is. And it's we're the easiest people to fool. We're the easiest to fool ourselves. You know. So when but, we are hitting the bottom, we cannot fool anymore. We are like, no, no, no. Let's 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 all let's face the this all here. the all the stuff we built, all the ego doors, all the special fancy coat of armors we have get stripped away. You know, and look. Life is not like life. No one promises all of us. All of no, we were never going to contract 100% life's going to be pleasant. We're going to face challenges. And a lot of those challenges are going to be inner challenges, nothing to do with the outside. And who we become in life is the person who faces these challenges and get through them. And that's how we grow. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we were never promised to just sit on the beach for from the born, born, we die, born to we die, die drinking Mai Tais. You know, there's going to be, if you're going to go strive, you're going to do things, and especially anyone who wants to achieve anything in life, you know, the driven ones, you know, in your world, especially, right? And like I come from the world of entrepreneurship and, and tech, very, very driven. You're going to have to face your demons somewhere along the way. And, you know, it's your choice how you go through it. And if you can literally face your demons, and when you do that, they take, it takes, the funny thing is we spend our lives running away from them, but when we face them, we realize they have no power over us. They were just our imagination, right? And when you do that, who you come through is a far better person who goes through life much better on a higher level. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, it recalled me your uh, Switch the Light chapter of your book. Yeah. And the, the snakes. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Do doctor who came. The hallucinated snakes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you switch the lights, right? There is darkness, and when you switch the light, you look at then you figure it out which one is real, which one are not. So yeah, absolutely. And uh, about facing our challenges, let me tell you this sentence: two partners, fear and fate. The one mm. you dance with determines your life. Is it familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. some rebirth. Yes, yeah. When I when I read that from your book, Robert, uh, the guy who told you the two partners, fear and fate, the one you dance with determines your life. It was like stuck. Yes, it's so cool. And then I I came with another question. Mm -hmm. It seems often we dance with both of them. True, true. And then eventually it became the dance of the fate, or we still continue our journey, still dancing with both of them. So it's still fear is there, but still the fate pushes us forward and we get comfortable with dancing with both of them. Yeah, that's a great point. There's, you know, it's, that was a, I remember when I wrote that with that character, I think it might've been, um, who did I have to say, like a Brazilian man said? Yeah, yeah, um, I can't remember from where, yeah, but he, it was a man who said that. Yeah, there's many because I had to create all these characters in the book. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, it's not 
And it's something I wrote about Love Yourself. It's not a one and done. You see, it's not like, you know, like, for example, the best example is if you want to get in shape and you say, okay, I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to get an incredible body. You dedicate yourself for a year. You eat really healthy. You work out five, six days a week. You know, you, you're just all in, just like you would be, like, if you were going for a gen, grandmaster, you know, level. You're just all in. A year later, like, your body is going to be a, a body of a completely different human being. You're going to look completely different, right? So you put in the work, and it shows. It shows in your, uh, shows in your physical body. Now, imagine the year after you say, you know what? I'm just going to sit in front of the TV and just eat cakes all day. You know, and you eat cakes for a year and sit in front of the TV. What's going to happen? It's going to degrade. The mind is the same way. You know, like one thing I've learned is that's why I call it, you know, James calls it a practice. I think I took that, I learned that from him. I call it a practice. The inner journey, the most important journey, you know, as we were talking about earlier, you know, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, you're alone in your head. You know, it's just you. That, 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 the most important game is just you. Um, is one that requires consistent work. You know, like the mind is a monkey. And especially if we have our train, we can train our mind to, uh, to create companies, to win, you know, to be incredible at chess, to be great at whatever sport or whatever. We can do that, but the rest of it is still running around like a monkey, and we have to work on it because <clears throat> if we don't, that's what that's that's the fear. Fears, I don't know why, but we're just wired for them. You know, they come up so so often. Which is the faith, of the, but I think what I was referring to the faith in, in that sense, and also was in a pilgrimage. So I think the character used that word. It's a more sense of the inner work, the work that we do to our inner self to make the inner self the, basically the head that we want to be inside. You know, and you're absolutely right. It's 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 a daily journey. It's a minute by minute journey, but it's a human journey. You know, we're here. The mind's doing its thing, whether we like it or not. Why not make it? Why not actually train it and make it just wonderful? And what's amazing is when your inner self gets better, right? Um, your actions get better. Your life get better. It's just a natural result. Your reactions to life get better. It's it makes your outer life. And something I've noticed, and and this, you know, like I don't talk much about, it, but I've learned that just when your inner self get better, things happen in your life that you just come at you. Just life just starts to work for you. I've just really learned that. Um, again and again by actually scoring up and not working myself and then just like so that's just my own little personal anecdote, my personal journey but I found a lot of readers reach out and tell me the same as well but your worst case scenario is inside you're going to feel good you know you're going to feel calm you're going to feel settled, you're going to feel loving you're going to feel, and it doesn't take away drive it doesn't, you know drive doesn't have to come, drive often comes for pain but drive come, but you can feel great about yourself and have drive. That's even way better. You know? You said, you said nicely. I loved very much when you said in your book, you love yourself, then your life starts to love yourself. And it doesn't have any other choice. And yeah. I don't know how that happens, but that works. So I am absolutely agree with you between that connection, how that works. Uh, one question I have is, when you hit the bottom, so in 2011, yeah, your company fell apart, you went through breakup, your close friend passed away, uh, so you, you, you hit the bottom and you, you started to come back. Why you came with love myself? Why it was not like every day telling yourself, I'm mm -hmm. happy or I'm strong? Mm -hmm. Why did you come with just that one? Uh, I understand with coming with affirmation, but why you pick I love myself. Great question. Look, I never set out to pick that. I was never a guy, honestly, who really even like believed in it that much. Um, let alone self love. I always poo pooed it. You know, I was an entrepreneur. I was building companies. I've been in the military. You don't think about these things. You know, never taught these things. What it was was, you know, I, everyone has a different. Um, you know, someone can hit bottom for various reasons, but bottoms are bottoms, right? So that's actually pretty normal in life. And so, so 2011, I did hit a bottom, and I was so miserable. And I was so sick and tired of being in my head, and that self-talk that was just 
horrific about myself and just I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve this. You know, I fucked, screwed up. I lost everything. Blah blah blah. You know the, um, you know the mind. And um, and I remember one night I was just like just there and I was so sick of it. I was like, I got to get out of this or die trying. I cannot live like this. I cannot live in this head. I'm. Go- it's just a horrible place to be. And I walked over to my journal and I wrote myself a vow. Now I'm a very big believer in the power of personal commitment. You know, I think the greatest things that one does in life comes from commitment to to it, to self. You know, you want to you be an Olympian, it takes a lot of commitment. You know, you want to be great at anything, it takes commitment. And then a vow, I think, is like even higher, like, you know, there's a marriage vow. You know, it's like it's, a, it's almost a sacred commitment. And if it's a vow just you make for yourself, it's a vow between you and all of life and whatever you believe in or not. But it's a, it's almost a sacred act. And I was just so sick of myself, I sat down and wrote a vow. And I thought the vow was going to be, I'm going to get out of this, or I'm going to be better, or I'm going to be, like, great, or I'll be successful. It was going to be something like that. But in that pure moment, that moment of that we talk about the bottom and the ego has been stripped away, when what came out was something I did not expect was that vow to love myself. And it's written in the book, it's way more um, poetic than I will say it here, but it was really, was like a, like, and I wrote it not poetically, I wrote it in desperation. I wrote it like, I, almost like, I'm done, and this is all I'm committing to. And it was like, I vow to love myself truly and deeply in every single way, every thought, every action, however I can, however, every moment I'm conscious, I vow to love myself. And it literally came out in desperation, written really harsh, like, you know, almost like, like wrote right through the paper onto the desk. And um, I remember sitting back thinking, where did that come from? Like, I wrote it, but it came from not the, the, it came from a deeper part than the conscious thinking part, you know. But here's the thing, because I made a vow, I just made a vow and it was in writing and it was in front of me. I could not then back away. I had to keep that vow. And so I set out to figure out how to do that. And that saved me and transformed my life. But honestly, I never set out to be to loving myself. It came from that moment of everything stripped away, that in that moment of almost desperation, something trying to save myself, and I was making a commitment that was going to save me. When I was reading your book and I and I came there, so that you started every day, m- many times a day, telling yourself, I love myself, I didn't figure out the power of it. And I was thinking, what else could be there that is stronger? But I got the power of it when I come to your chapter about questioning, when you had that, you ask yourself, if I love myself, what I would do? If I love myself, what I would not do. And then you come up like, really, if I love myself, I don't eat that chips or I don't eat that soda or I don't do that. And then you start really healing yourself with that questioning. Then I felt like, yeah, it's so deep. You don't say I am healthy, I am happy, I am something. I love myself. And then you ask that great question. If I loved myself, if, what, what, what I would do differently? Yeah, that if part, I remember when I came up with that, um, because I was doing this practice, I was getting better, I was doing the inner practice, um, and and then, but I was still having to go and experience the outer world, and I remember I was having, like, some, uh, I was having some, like, uncomfortable conversations with, now that I was having to shut the company down, I was having uncomfortable conversations, and I was feeling pretty bad again, right? And then I I would just ask myself, if... And now the if part, I'm very proud of for coming up with that one, because if part actually is, if I may say so, the genius part of the question. Because if you say, because I love myself, or I love myself, what should I do? The brain, nine times out of ten, will say, well, no, you don't. You know, or like poo-poo itself, or whatever, like, come on, it's you. You know, like, it's, it, it'll, or even if it wants it consciously, it'll, it'll, like, tug at it. But the if is purely hypothetical. Right, you can always answer an if question. If I was Superman, what would I do? You can answer that question. It's 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 purely hypothetical. So the brain goes along with it, right, and answers it, and then I knew the answer. So like, if I was having an uncomfortable conversation, if I love myself, what would I do? 
I would not let that uncomfortable conversation ruin my peace of mind. I would go back to loving myself. You know, but that comes in the same thing. If I love myself, if like I'm feeling lazy, but I know I need to go to the gym, you have to make this a practice. You can't just pull this question out every five, five weeks or so. You know, the, the key with all of this is you make it a practice of doing it throughout the day, and then it becomes a part of your just normal mental loop, and you just start doing and answering. And by the way, um, when I ask for that question, it doesn't mean 100% of the time I do the answer. I'm still a human being. You know, sometimes I want to eat that bag of chips. Sometimes I want to skip that workout. Sometimes it feels better to feel shitty than better. You know, it's that old loop, right? So you do it, but now you're doing it consciously. You're like, oh, I just made a choice to do that. I wasn't on. And it's really powerful. If you think about it as human being, if we, we go through our life making conscious choices, even if they're good for or bad for us, we know we're doing it. Right? There's power in that because eventually you keep asking for that question, you will stop doing it. You will get sick of it. Because now you know the answer. And the answer came from you. That's the best place to come from. So you don't want your subconscious, that, that little worm that wants left and right to do things, you bring it to yourself so you do it at least consciously. Even if it's wrong. Yeah. You do even it if, it's, if it is bad for you, even if you're like going to go do whatever crazy, stupid thing you know is bad for you, but you're doing it consciously now. Right. And you do that again and again. And eventually you will, you know, we're human beings. We, we want to be better. We are, that is, that is part of our wiring. You know, like my, my venture fund is called Evolve VC. I'm a big believer in personal evolution. I think that's what life is about, personal evolution. And, and, uh, eventually you will get sick of yourself consciously making the stupid choice and you will make the better choice. That's the funny thing. It, and, and you won't have to work at it. It'll just be your humanness doing it, right? There's no work here. It's just, you know, in the moment, just teaching yourself the, like how to be inside your mind. That's it. The rest just, you know, plays itself out. Tell, tell, I love myself even if you don't feel it and you create, and you create as you described in your book, the mental loop. Um, does it work just just as as it works for affirmations? Can you elaborate that mental loop? I read it, but I want listeners listeners to hear that. How you create this mental loop and what's the power of everyday telling I love myself? Well, you know, it's more than just affirmations. I was never like a big fan of affirmations uh, because you can sit there and tell yourself and just feel the opposite. So what the whole point was, when I was first trying to figure out how to love myself, I didn't go read any books on it. Um, yeah, the guy who's written a book on it, I think, because I didn't trust most self-help authors because I think a lot of it's written from a place of theory. You know, most of it's not practical. And I come from an entrepreneurship world. I was in the military. Everything is, what I, my training was, was to be practical, right? I only care, I don't care what I have to do, but I only care about the result in those situations, right? So the result was, I got to fix my head. The result, the vow made was to love myself. How do I do it? So I sat around and I was like, well, at some point, I just started saying it to myself. I was like, I'm not, I can't come over. So I started saying it to myself. And obviously, I didn't believe it. My mind would rebel against you. Your mind comes up with all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Because now you're going against really wiring from all these years that we've been alive. And... But eventually I noticed that if I started making myself feel myself, and this was this is really powerful, we think we're a lot of people live life as if they're not empower that their feelings are empower them. It's actually the other way. You're empowered your feelings. You can literally sit there and create feelings. You can do it. You can sit there and create feelings. We just don't do it. Again, I'm talking about being conscious. Consciously create a feeling. And so like you know, the, the classic thing in neuroscience, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together, right? Like, I have, an, I have a degree in biology. I'm no expert. I just know enough to be dangerous, you know? Like, so, so it was like neurons that wire together, fire, as fire together, wire together. It was like, oh, so when I started to create, consciously create this feeling, now whether my mind said, hey, this feeling is bullshit or not, the feeling was there. The feeling was the feeling. And so what I would do is I started doing these things like with the meditation. I would imagine just light coming in 
from all the universe and love just coming in. I would just do all these things. The encapsulation of that is in the book, but I would do all these things to make myself feel just being drenched in love, like I love myself, just feeling it. It sounds idiotic, right? And I felt idiotic doing it. To swear. I didn't do it to write a book. I was literally trying to save myself and I was trying to keep that vow, right? That's all I was doing. I was not doing this for anybody else. I didn't care how stupid it was. It was in my head. No one ever was ever gonna know about it. I just cared about a result. And what I discovered was, when you do the feeling, eventually, I noticed those feelings after a certain amount of time, me for almost like consciously creating the feeling throughout the day, and through the through actually making myself telling, I love myself, makes myself feel it, but the light coming in and all that. I noticed after some period of time, we're talking like short period, we're talking days. I started feeling that just in moments where I wasn't doing it consciously. I was like, wait a minute, where's that coming from? And and it was like, oh my God, this is, then I got to do this more. So I just kind of went down the rabbit hole. And and so it wasn't just straight up affirmations. It wasn't just straight up, I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be healthy, I love myself, blah, blah, blah. It was actually creating that, that again, that feeling, that state inside my head. That's what I was doing. That's the secret to this, right? And it's not hard. One just has to consciously do it. And then do it again and again to consciously set the time aside and do it. Like I do this thing I wrote about the book, you know, 10 breaths throughout the day. I'll stop and take 10 deep breaths. I make myself feel this and I'll go on. Do this throughout the day. We're gonna take, you're gonna take, gonna take breath through the day anyway, right? As long as you're alive, right? You could be sitting there in a Zoom meeting, put it out of your mind and be doing this. You could be doing whatever, right? And, and you know what it does? It does something inside and it feels good. And, I mean, that right there is your worst case scenario. You feel good, you know, and you're doing it, you're doing it consciously. The whole thing about this is like, look, you're consciously setting, what you're doing is you're consciously setting patterns in your brain that eventually become unconscious and run on their own. But you got to do it. No one can do it for you. That's the good news and the you bad news. You nurture, yeah, you nurture your subconscious mind until it works for you. I do. Yes. Nurture, you said? Or... Yeah, yeah, you nu- you nurture your subconscious mind until it yeah. does the work for you, and you don't do it consciously anymore. Yeah, I mean, but I'll be honest with you, I still have to do consciousness every day, and I will do the consciousness the day I die. But that's like saying people say that's work. Well, if I want to be healthy, I want to age healthy and then gracefully, I will have to work. I need healthy. You know, that's just the price of being human. You know, you want to live a great life inside. You want to live a great, have a great body. You do the work, and you keep doing so it. T- keep... Till now, you do it. Yeah, do you till yeah. now you do that. Love yourself mm-hmm. practice till now. I mean, I have, I'm always someone who's a you know personal evolution. The whole so I'm always like working on the next thing. I'm always trying to figure out what how can I take this deeper? How can I be better? Right? Um, and so I do that. But the fundamentals, yeah. And like one of the very important things, like like I'll do is like when I'm falling asleep at night or when I wake up, I'll do this because it's something. Um, when falling asleep, I think the term is a hypnagogic state. We're very. Uh, we're, we can really, really like perceptible. We're really like easily, we can be, it's basically like a hypnotic state. It's, it's a great time. You're basically doing self-hypnosis. So this thing you've turned out of the day, do it at night and do it as you're falling asleep. That's so you just naturally, now you're really layering in the subconscious. Same thing when you wake up, when that groggy, rather than, you know, and I have a bad habit. Sometimes I'll put on my phone and get on Reddit. I love Reddit, you know, and <laughs> just like Reddit. But, but like before I do that, I will do this for like a couple of minutes. So if I set my alarm for 10 minutes, for those 10 minutes, I'll just lie in bed and do that. And like, because I know I'm layering this in and I know what this does. I've seen it happen in my life. I've seen it happen like God knows how many readers of this book across the world, you know, so why not do it? Because also, because I write about in the book, when I stopped doing it for a long time, my brain kind of became a shit show again. You know, like it's just like the eating cakes for a year. You know, your body does, shows it. I think the mind shows it faster, honestly. Uh, so it is our responsibility to ourselves. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you, you know Wim Hof? Yeah. The yeah. Iceman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at, at our office in the afternoons, before going, before having lunch, so in the office we all have lunch together, yeah? So in the afternoon, before going to lunch, some of us are going to our basement where is the cinema room and mm-hmm. we are doing his uh, breathing techniques. Okay. So 
uh, when I read your book, I didn't do it in the morning and I didn't do it in the night. But then when we were there, so we were anywhere breathing, mm-hmm. 30, sec, 30 times you are breathing and then you are holding your breath for one minute and then one and a half minute and so on. Like what I'm doing that one minute, just nothing. Yeah, not not thinking about anything. Let's try this. Let's tell uh-huh. myself. So I breathe. I, I love myself. And then I take it out. So I did it. I did it the first time. So it was 10 minutes. I was breathing, saying I love myself, and then I was holding my breath. Uh, I was again telling myself I love my breath. Uh, sorry, I love myself. So from the basement, after ten minutes, we went we went back to the to our main floor, and something interesting I felt. I felt love for others. I hugged my wife differently. Uh-huh. I hugged my little bird. We have. African gray bird here. I hugged her. I hugged him differently. Then I went to my teammates and I just hugged them. And I like something happened. It's it's not I loved myself more, but there was just love inside me and in the air somehow. And like wow, this is so magical. And it's it's available to any of us, and it's inside us, right? It's so simple. Um, and I really, really love Oxum's razor, right? Like the simplest solution. I always go for the simplest solution. That's why actually I didn't read anything on this because I just didn't trust most people writing about this if that's what their living was. Like I, you know, I was living as my living is as an entrepreneur. So like, even though I was trained to uh, uh, trained in writing to write lyric fiction. Um, I just wanted to figure it out for myself in the simplest way possible. In the simple, I didn't want to do anything complicated. I didn't want to stand on my head. I didn't want to do yoga. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted the simplest, easiest, laziest way I could do this. <laughs> you know? And honestly, I think it's the simplest ones that work. I am still struggling with the meditation. I bought. Do you know? Do you know what is Muse? Yeah. Yeah. Muse, so you put on your on your head, and whenever your your mind wa- goes away, there is that rain. So the rain becomes big, stronger. So you, you it makes you come back to to you. And I still struggle, struggle. And when I read about you, and you said, I cannot do more than two minutes of meditation. So I got lazy. <laughs> and you and you created love yourself meditation for yourself. When you put the beautiful music and you not just sit there and like when this will finish, so you enjoy that meditation with under the music. Please take me through that. Uh, how do you do your seven minute meditation usually? Seven minutes. How do you and do it's that? Only be- it's an only because that piece of music I discovered was seven minutes long. If it was three minutes long, it would have been three minutes. Look, I, I, like I said, I wanted to go for the most practical, laziest, effective way. Right, the most practical, laziest, but effective way to do this. And so, I wasn't going to sit there meditating for hours or whatever. Like, oh my God, that's a, that would be like torture. So, I, so I, I found a piece of music uh, that I really liked. That, and the, this is the key: find a piece of music. It shouldn't have vocals because it shouldn't be like jarring any any memories like that or any like um, anything there. But just let it be like instrumental. By this enough instrumental, beautiful instrumental music out there, and something that I had positive associations to. So if I listened, I felt good anyway, right? I had no negative associations about it. So I would put on that piece of music, and then I would do the what I was doing with the with the what I call the love yourself meditation, where I would actually imagine all this light coming in from above, from the basically galaxies and you know just light. And the, the theme of light actually go, is woven through the book a lot because I work a lot with that. Just imagining light inside, it helped me a lot, right? So I would like, imagine light coming in and just flowing into my, because I was pretty sick at the time. I was worn out. So I, I imagine light just flowing into my body, right? And in the, the light was just was love and light. And it was just doing what life does, what light does. It takes away the darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. It's not its own thing. It's the absence of light. So if you have light there, there's no darkness. So dark, it was just that. And then with my, that would be the in-breath. And the out-breath, it, I would just release 
and they would just go and take out everything that it needed to. And just do that and feeling love and light, you know, until that piece of music ended. And still, honestly, my mind would wander. Next thing I know, I'm solving some problem or I'm yelling at someone or I'm thinking about something. And then, but the piece of music would remind me, hey, like, it's almost like, hey, go back to this because this is going to end. Especially after a little time, you still, your brain starts to know when that piece of music is going to end. It's almost like if your mind's wandering, you're like, oh, I better, I better do this because it's going to end. And, and so it, was, it just happened to be seven minutes long. Right, and I tell people in the book, people I get so many years of people telling me, "Can you tell me what that piece of music is?" And I always tell them, but I'm like, "Look, it doesn't matter. What matters is you. It's you, right? It's it's a and a and equals and a one, right? It's you. That's that. So like, whatever make piece of music makes you feel really good, and do that. I just do this practice, and you will feel that shift. And even if you don't feel it the first, you will feel that shift over time. It, it's it's like very very powerful, and. Um, Another thing I notice is, after a while, the moment I put that piece of music on, my main, my mind went into that state of light and love. Anchoring, yeah, it I'd anchored works. it. I'd anchored it, right? So, like, don't you know? Like, it was interesting. Your mind just starts anchoring these things. It's because Pavlovian, right? Um, lazy, you know, <laughs> simple, effective. Um, when, uh. I was about at, at my twenties. I developed this practice for me, and it did magic for me. So what I did, uh, whenever I win the game, only when I win, not when I drew, not after the game, only when I win, I had a certain set of songs in my playlist. I would go and listen to them, and then next time before the game, I would listen these songs mm. that. I only listen when I'm winning. So basically, I was listening to them only when I'm winning and only before the game. And it was creating such a beautiful state for me, that anchoring effect. I didn't know what is neuroscience. I didn't know how it works. I just built for myself. And at that time, I was taking with myself um, MP3, MP3 player, just taking to the playing hall. I was sitting there with earphones before the game and just listening my favorite songs. Unfortunately, then Fide came with rules that you cannot take electronics <laughs> to the games and so on. And my performance immediately oh went down. Oh my god, that's so because, funny! That's so funny. Because you know, I could not but use you can. There's something you can do. Like when I was in the army and I was in boot camp, I was an 18 year old Fort Benning, Georgia, and. Um, you know, basically, boot camp is designed to just make you very miserable, to take you to civilian, turn you into a, a soldier. But you, I remember there'd be days we'd be standing in formation, and Fort in Georgia is very hot in the summer and very, very humid. Just standing there, and we weren't allowed to have any music or whatever. And I think I just had a year of college, and I discovered Pink Floyd, and I'd really got into Pink Floyd at that time. And so... I'd be standing there in at attention with some drill sergeant yelling at me, and I was just, just standing there because sometimes that they just make you stand there because let's see how you can stand there and not pass out, right? It's just part of the part of the thing. And but I would, I could have a drill sergeant yelling at me, but in my head I was listening to Pink Floyd concerts. I was happy as a clown in my head, like it didn't bother me, right? So <laughs> it's funny, right? You just use the mind. Pink Floyd, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I love your I love your hack. That's a great hack. I mean, and, and it's there's nothing unethical about it. What you're doing is you're getting yourself in that state you are when you win, how you feel. And again, but what you do is you're consciously creating it rather than waiting to win. But you but the funny thing, uh, the great thing is that you're more likely to win a game when you're in that state. It's so interesting, yeah. How how, how with our own brain. We can mm -hmm. trick our mind, and then it works for us. Uh, just, so, just it's not trick. That. It's not trick. The mind just works the way it does. Yeah. Now be consciously corralling it. That's all it is. You know, yeah, just Wait, there's, no there's no tricks here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. tricks here. It's just it's consciously taking control, or consciously guiding it. You know, my God, what a gift! I wish we had learned as children how to like guy use your mind. You know. It's the, just the same way, yeah, when you just sit, you are sad, 
you don't want to smile, but you make yourself smile. In just 30 seconds, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. smile, and suddenly some chemistry changes changes in your yeah. in your brain. Uh, there consciously, you do it. Interesting- you do it consciously, right? Once again, right? You're not waiting yeah. for life to make you smile. You choose to make yourself smile. And look, there's power in that. If you start becoming the person inside who chooses, like, you know, I am the man, I choose who I'm going to be regardless of the world inside. There's, that's true power. You know, this power of the self. And it's available to any of us. True. I, t- I want to tell you this story. Uh-huh. Uh, I... I was playing some tournaments. I was about to retire from chess, professional chess. I was not playing very well. Uh, so I was sitting at dinner after a bad game, just eating my, my food. And then, uh, so I was grandmaster then. A much learned player came to me and said, can I sit with you? He said, of course, yeah, sit here. And then he said, do you want to win the last three games? So he's like learned it. I was his, I was his level like, 15 years ago. Uh, but he said, I think, I think I can help you to win the last three games. So how you say it in your book, yeah? When, when somebody gave you a gift, you just take it, right? <laughs> said, yeah, let's do that. And he said, let's go to the walk. Uh, so we walked and then we came up with this experiment. And I said, okay, it's anyway. And nothing can go worse than now it's going on. So this was the experiment. I'm going to play the game. And whenever he walks to my chess board and he looks at me, I have to smile and I will need to correct my posture. I will need to sit straight, like sit straight and smile. And it was at some point very idiotic because he would come, look at me and I smile and he goes <laughs> and okay, I continue the game. But then he would uh-huh. come and look at me and I need to smile as long as, he's, as, as, he, as he looks at me. So his all, all, all philosophy was that I'm just too tensioned, my mood is not good, I'm just suffering there, while I could have fun. He said, you are so strong, you just need to have fun. Uh, I won very beautiful last three games, and it was a life lesson for me, how whenever things go wrong, how you can just correct your posture, how you can smile. It took me time to learn about NLP, neuroscience, and learn how it really works. But then I was using these things unconsciously, just figuring out, learning how my brain, conscious, unconscious, how this all are together wired, and how I can use it the way I want. Yeah, you look, I mean, it's used a lot in, uh, in sports. You know, you look at any remarkable athletes, they use this visualization. They use this kind of, you know, these kind of things with, where they have these rituals that they create, you know, is to get them in that state, especially in a, in a, in a field like athletics where everything has to be on tune to almost to a millisecond level. And if it fails, you know, like you've lost because of the caliber of the people you're going against. And, it, and it's like so fast, right? But let's, so, uh, so this, this stuff exists on a, for, on a higher level for high caliber people. Why not just do it for ourselves? You know, we're all, regardless of whatever caliber we're playing this game of life, you know, it makes it better. But here's the thing. It's something I've discovered, it's something I've learned for myself. If I know the knowledge, but if I'm in a bad state, I'm less likely to apply it. You know, sometimes we're comfortable in our misery. There's a comfort in misery. There's a comfort in feeling bad. You know, it's a very, it's a very, it's familiar, right? So that's why it's so important to create a practice that you do this regularly. So when you're you're doing it when you're feeling good, you're doing it when you're feeling natural, neutral, you're doing it when you're feeling bad. Doesn't matter. It's a practice. Every day you go to the gym, you're eating healthy, it's a practice. Right? You don't just go to the gym and then just wait till you get fat again. You know, like, you, like so that is the thing I've noticed with myself. Is like I'm less likely to do it, even though I know I, what I need to do. Unless I'm doing it regularly and it becomes just a habitual pattern. You know, I, I do a lot of things where I'll just like create habitual patterns in my life. So then I, it's just like, 
you know, the way I unlock my car, the way I do these things, I just do them because I just don't have to think. It's a natural thing, right? And we all have our visual patterns of brushing our teeth or whatever. We just talk, I'm just talking about mental patterns, right? So that is something to keep in mind that the knowledge by itself is not enough, you know? And even occasional application of knowledge is not enough. It's consistent application of the knowledge that creates real transformation or the word magic. It's consistent application whether you feel like it or not. You just commit, and that's why I like a big thing about making, you know, in the book, you know, writing the vow, right? You write your vow and understand what you've just done. Right, and then you come in, you look at that vow, and then you do it. And who are you doing it for? No one but yourself. Why? Because you deserve it. You're here. Make yourself better. You said, if you have the knowledge, but you are not in the correct state, you don't apply very well, right? Yeah. Um, you know what? You know what is what is Trasmut's slogan? No. It is right mood, right move. <laughs> so all all my life I learned that all my bad tournaments every bad game is when I was not in that state I was not in a mood so always I failed and my best tournaments my peak performance were, happened only when I was in that state I was in the flow I was in the mood mm -hmm. so yeah I absolutely understand what you say uh, come on that's great though right you were in right move, right move I love it and, and so we're just consciously yeah. creating a I, I will pattern send you of that a move. On that. Please do, please do. And but now we're creating consciously creating the pattern of that mood, so it's easier to access moment you know when we need it as well. If it's not a habitual thing, it's harder to access. Yeah, Kamal, well, you have you have been in in military. You were in army. Um, okay, before I tell you my question, so. One of the biggest impact on me to become a grandmaster was at 12, my dad got angry at me and he said, no more chess. And I went to MMA. I no went kidding. to fight club. Okay. So one year I was fighting. The first fight, the first fight I got very badly beaten. Then I had my choice. So I went, I started to train one year. Uh, anyway, uh, that all one year, I think, looking back, had the biggest impact on my chess career. I had to have that one year in MMA and fight. Uh, what impact had ARMY on your life? Huge. Um, I was never in combat, so um, I didn't experience that. But just, you know, as an 18-year-old, going in, not knowing anything about yourself, or not, I mean, 18, you think you know everything about yourself, but you really don't. <laughs> And, you know, being challenged and being challenged every, the whole point of a boot camp and infantry training is to just challenge you and train you and challenge you and train you and transform you. That was a heck of a gift. You know, like I think in, uh, if you look at a lot of ancient societies, they have a ritual of like where the boy becomes a man. And um, so I was, I was speaking as a boy because, you know, boy, man, because that's my gender. Uh, you know, when a boy becomes a man, and they have to go prove themselves. They have to do something. And then they you know, they have, there's a ritual, you know, like there's something that they have to do, you know, down to like, you know, even vision quests from the Native Americans or some of the, some of the Aboriginal tribes. Um, so there is something there that you come back and you challenge yourself, you face yourself and you come back changed, you know, which is also the classic hero's journey, which is basically every great story ever told. You know, you can look at Star Wars, you know, it's the classic hero's journey. You go do the hero's journey and you come back and now you're a man. And now you you know, you now you have like an expanded role in your tribe. I think in our modern society, at least American society, we're missing that. You know, it was like straight go to high school, go to college, get out, get a job, you know, get a wife, two point five kids, get a house, you know, and all those, right? And next thing you know, it's like what just happened. Um, whereas, you know, I think the something like the uh I look back at the 18 year old, what a gift he gave me with that, with that experience of boot camp training at that age really showed me that I was capable of more, that I was, I could be beaten down every day and just get up and face it. You know, and it was, it was a really great gift. Um, it also allowed me to have a sense of, um, 
trusted myself that I could handle what was thrown at me as far as physically, you know, back, back around the world. And like, I felt safe because, you know, and then when you've been in the military and then you've had, you, you kind of just feel like you can handle things that come at you. And I have been that guy when things happen, I can handle things. So it gave me that gift. And let me think also about things differently. Like, you know, I was in the infantry and at Fort Benning, Georgia, the, uh, people ask me, what did I learn about leadership as far as building companies or investing in companies? You know, what have I learned? Because leadership is such an important and rare, a true leadership is a rare trait. And the best thing I learned about leadership, I learned when I was 18 years old in Fort Benning, Georgia. And it was actually the first night, uh, first day I was taken to Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, they picked me up at the airport and they took us in a bus. And when you're going in, you you pass a statue of a World War II infantryman. He's charging at a position. He's like his one hand forward. He's charging a position, right? He's got a rifle in the other. And underneath the plaque says, follow me. And that stuck with that 18-year-old somehow memorized that, that image in his head. And it stuck with me because leadership is about leading by example. Follow me. It's not do as I'd say. Do as... So when I was building a company, it was always like I was the first in, last out. Outworked everyone, paid myself last, as any any entrepreneur will understand, right? And it was like it came from that follow me, and like the team that I built, they would have done anything for me. And I learned this from other great business leaders as well. It's like you lead by being, you don't, you can't expect the best from others if you're not being your best. You cannot expect them to step up for you if you haven't stepped up way more than you're requiring of them. You know, so it had a huge impact on me. One I'm very grateful for. Nice, beautiful. Uh, what about the toughness the army gave you? Uh, I had a student. I, I I gave that advice to many students, but the first time I gave it, it was a student uh, who was from Thailand. He was very smart, bright kid, but something was missing. His fighting spirit was not something there. So I told his father instead of taking him three three four days a week chest training, take him two days chest training. Today yeah, takes yeah, him yeah. to Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah. You are in Thailand. You have these so many Muay Thai schools. Take him to Muay Thai. So what's the that toughness that army gave you? I think, first of all, that's great advice. You know, one of the things, one of the best things we can do is, it's it's funny, like, sometimes we go out of our discipline to learn other things that we can't learn in our discipline, then we apply to our discipline to be better in our discipline. So what you did there was like it gives him a certain sense. Of, it'll give him a certain sense of confidence and a certain sense of toughness that he maybe would not have gotten from his discipline of chess, right? And, and the same thing, you could take someone at Muay Thai and give them a different experience, right, to make them better in Muay Thai. We often have to go. We should actually. Our discipline is in the one on end all be all for life for living the game the game of life, right? And I think that was brilliant that you did. I mean, the army. It was. It was just being. You know, challenges thrown at me every day, every morning, and every night, and all the hours in between. How do? How long did you stay there? A total of three years. I did part of it in the reserves. Three years. Uh, yeah. Kamal, uh, so y you wanted to challenge yourself. You wanted to find something inner. You had some inner questions. Similar thing you had done with your Camino de Santiago. Yeah. W w what age did mm -hmm. you go there? Camino de Santiago. I was twenty-five. I turned twenty-six on the Camino. Okay, so two times you had this, this, this thing that m many of us would not just ourselves with our intention going to army, with our intention going uh, 36 days, yeah? 36 days you went, you walked there. Yeah, something uh, like that, yeah. How is it coming that moment when you feel, I need a challenge, I need to, to go inner myself? How is it coming that, like, I'm doing this? It's not that. It's not that I sit around thinking I need a challenge. I sit around thinking, what do I want to experience? And I wanted to experience being a soldier. Like I, I and also like you know, I was an immigrant child. I wanted to give back to my country. You know, I was I wanted to give back to America. This country had that taken me in. You know, as a small, as a young child. So I thought that was the best way to do it. Um, I do things like that. It's like I think I, I, I look at life as a series of experiences. It's like the core experiences that we remember, end up remembering that big, become our key memories, right? And usually those aren't the easiest times either. But it's, it's, uh, I prefer the ones where I'm consciously choosing these experiences that challenge me and make me better. It's always the, the key is I always want to be better 
and I want to be better in some sort of practical way. So I'll tell you for an example that's something I started doing a year ago. Um, I woke up one day and I thought, have you watched the John Wick movies? Yeah. I'm familiar, but not not a big fan of that. Too too much blood for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I woke up one day and I thought, I want to be John Wick. So <laughs> I went out and set up my own John Wick training program. And I found this incredible soldier from uh, the SEAL Team 6 who's retired. And he took me on as a one-on-one student. And I started training with him. Oh. And I trained with him for a month. And... And uh, he, you know, on combat shooting because John Wick is a very, very good shooter. And I just, I thought, here's a very interesting lesson I learned. You will, have, anyone in the chess world understand this. Something I learned, I was going to do it just with giggles. Like, I thought it'd be fun, right? Just like, okay, I need to do something, something interesting. I need to have an experience in my life. Let me add this, right? And the man I ended up training with, SEAL Team 6 is the best of the best in the United States. And he's been in a lot of combat and survived and, you know, done some incredible things. And what I learned, what I realized quickly was I was not studying with soldier. I was studying with a modern day samurai who had come back from the wars, hung up his sword, and now had taken me on as a student. And he is a master of the craft. And again, very practical because he's been tested many times in battle, right? Many, many, many times. And when you study with a master, I didn't, I was never a fan. Honestly, I was in the military. I was never a fan of guns or whatever, but I just, they were like something as a, they were just something to do. I fell in love with combat shooting because I studied with a master. When you study with a master, you bypass all the useless bad habits, whatever, and like, and you can't let him down. I call him sensei. I don't want him, I don't I never call his name. I always call him sensei, right? And I have such respect for him and the fact that he let me, took me on as a student. First, he thought I was crazy, you know, that, that he told me there were days he would push me so hard that he thought I would just never show up the next day and I showed up the next day, right? And, and here's the interesting thing. So one, learning from a master, I fell in love with the craft. And it's like a martial art. For a combat shooting was is literally a martial art. Martial art with a gun, right? Which is the weapon. And I fell in love with the craft and I got really good at it because of it. But also here's a very interesting thing. I'd gone through some severe physical trauma in twenty nineteen. I'd lost about almost about two years of my life in insane pain until I had surgery to fix everything. And in that time, like I worked on my head a lot to just keep myself afloat. You know, when you're in severe pain, like severe pain, um, I did my, I did the love yourself practice to keep myself afloat and, and it worked, right? It kept me afloat and got me through. And, but I had lost some of my confidence as a man. I'll just be very, very honest. It's not something I've ever shared before, but just like two day, two years of being in insane pain, just feeling almost like, like an invalid. I'd lost a lot of my confidence and what this, I didn't realize this, but, but working with this, this, Training with him gave me a whole new level of confidence I don't think I ever had. I didn't go out to this. I didn't say I want to have an experience that's going to create confidence. I just picked an experience I thought would be, well, that sounds like fun. And then I found a master. And then, then all of a sudden it gets real, right? And I fell in love with the craft. And getting better at any craft where you apply yourself, especially if you're like getting, if you're lucky enough to serve the master, you develop a confidence. You develop a great confidence. And I'm so grateful to that. Uh, for my own personal job and training program, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I, I know what is it. I, I, I have, I have trained kung fu for many years, and I uh-huh. had a master. I would, I would work with him three days a week. Sorry, three days, three trainings a day sometimes. Wow. So first was five a.m. Next was six p.m. The last was ten p.m. So I know what is that experience with wow. two master, and it's change not just that what you wanted to learn you want you went there for to shoot i went there for just learning kung fu but then you learn so much more and you learn from them and suddenly you learn also from your inside yeah you learn things that you didn't know you have them so yeah there, yeah I, I know what, what 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 is that to work with master um well, one thing i'm very surprised <laughs> so um it was it was last year when I learned about you 
and about your brother Naval. And uh, I spent all my time with you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, for few reasons. Uh, one is that uh, I had this when motivational speakers are speaking, how they made millions, billions. It's all about numbers, money, that, that, that. I was very interested that you talk about uh, not just going to success, but also that inner game. And you, that you both are not just professionally successful, but in life you you have these philosophies. And one thing I found common in both of you that surprised me very much. You both said you are lazy. Really? He says he's lazy? Ah, oh, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of myself as lazy. Yeah, Naval says I'm lazy. He says I don't want to work, so I'm figuring out that, that, that. And now, during our talk, you say that you are lazy, you didn't want to do meditation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't want that. It's true. But still, it's true. still, you are achieving. This question, I think, will be very interesting for the chess players also, because often they are lazy, but they are still going forward. And looking back myself, often I was lazy, but I still became a grandmaster. How does this work? Yeah, because all we have learned that from school, hard work, that, that, that. But now you two brothers whom I admire so much, you both say that you are lazy. That's so funny. That is so funny. Oh, my God. That, I'm just laughing because it's my brother. I'm just thinking of him, you know, because he's, I mean, like, look, I love him and I also admire him. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's very impressive. Um but yeah, I think in our laziness, I'll speak for myself, in my laziness, I try to find the most easiest, effective way to do what I want. To do what I want. Keep the line, you know? yes, James would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also when you care, you, when you care about something, like my brother built AngelList because he deeply cared about taking the power of Nobisis and giving it back to entrepreneurs, right? Um, when you deeply care, that's when you put in the time. I think it's good to be lazy for... Things that don't matter. But when you really care, like, for example, for writing, I trained for a decade to be a literary fiction writer with no success, just rejection letters, right, until I had success. What kept me going? You know, if I was, if, yes, I was lazy, but, like, I kept me going because I cared. It mattered to me. It was, like, my thing. I wanted to be better. I wanted to be, like, great at the craft of writing and you can never be the master because you can always be better that's i love crafts like that you can never be a true master because there's always a way to be there's always something beyond right um so you have to care but i am lazy about a lot of things in my life and i kind of laugh at myself but now i think it's easy like maybe it's a good thing you're lazy about the things that don't matter and then when you care you step up so you save your energy huh? Eh? Yeah, but also I'm lazy with writing a lot too, honestly. You know, but when I when I had that piece to write, I would I would I, you know I would do it no matter what, and I would be lazy to the day, and then I would just like oh I gotta I gotta write I gotta write, put this uh, much work in, but it, you still do it. I yeah, I mean I pref that's been my my journey, uh, but when I care, you know, I go all in, and then I'm I'm out. Yes, yeah, so I'm kind of keep keep balance, yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, feast or famine. I was telling someone the other day. Yeah, yeah, I was telling someone the other day. It's like I run sprints and then I just walk or chill. I work really hard and then I'll just like sit around and do nothing, you know. And I think that's kind of I like that way because the mistakes I made like was like run a sprint too long or chill too long, right? But so when you have things you care about, you will naturally step up. And I think, honestly, a lot of, uh, I, I kind of like, I'm almost going to take it as a compliment because a lot of the very best people I've met consider themselves lazy. <laughs> you know, so that's true, great. True. <laughs> because we are hardest on ourselves, you know, like, but in the end, like, look, it, did it work? Did it get you what you wanted? Great. It worked. Uh, come on, I want to come back to one of uh, the chapters from of your book uh, about forgiveness. Uh, and I felt like you, you have a chapter there, but the whole, your third book, Rebirth, is all about that forgiveness and how you forgave your dad. Um, I had a very hard time with forgiveness. 
uh, myself, I was very angry of my for for my former partner. I was very angry, and I couldn't forgive him no matter what. And eventually, I did with help of both Jayashet, Jayashetty, with Xama, with forgiveness and similar things you 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 described in your book. Um, one thing I will tell you, which which might surprise you. I asked my grandmaster friend, "What do you do when you blunder?" Mm. So you, during the game, you make a huge mistake. So I had already written an article what to do, how to recover after you make a bad blunder. But he told me some things that I was I didn't think about. And he told me that because he read your book earlier than me. Really? He said, when I blunder, yeah. He said, when I blunder, the first thing I do, I forgive myself. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so I made the blunder. I did mistakes. So instead of yelling at me, what a stupid guy, how you play chess, shameful, what is this? I forgive me. And I thought like, wow, that's so strong. And that you can do it basically after the bad game. You lost the game. Instead of yelling at yourself, you say, I forgive my mistake. Then bad tournament, I forgive myself. Um... Tell me, tell me about this. You took to, you took your friend to a beautiful place, and you both wrote letters, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you took it from the cliff. Um, there you wrote that you forgive yourself that you choose money game instead of being a doctor. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you still continued the money game. Uh, is it yes that you can forgive and you understand you can, cannot fix that uh, and you still go with that? Or you no, I made a conscious choice. I made a conscious choice. Right? Do you realize that, okay, it's just conscious choice, but I still go with that? I forgave myself that I didn't go with that? No, but it wasn't the money game. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the money game. It was a startup game. And I realized I loved it. I loved the challenge. I loved the growth. I loved the intelligent people. I was around all the time and I was learning. Whereas to be a doctor, I would have to give up, you know, for four years of just, you know, medical school and all this other stuff. About seven years, I have to give up basically my connection with the world. And at that time, you know, I started the internet uh, startups in the late, in, in 99. And so like this, the future was being built then. I was a part of that. So it was very, I really realized this is what I want, where all that time I thought I wanted to be a doctor, so I had to let that go. But look, the forgiveness thing, I don't talk about forgiving others in the Love Yourself book. In the Rebirth book, I talk about forgiving my father. And what it took me to forgive my father was very simple. Realizing his humanity. Realizing just like you know, he suffered. You know, he was a human being. He was, he was a... He was a flawed human being, but I don't think I'm a perfect human being. He was flawed and because I got to experience that flawness, I hated him for as a child. You know, it becomes the whole father son dynamic, you know, it can get very, very, you know, like, I get, you know, combative. Um, and I realized he was a human being. You know, he tried his best, but he could. And, and he was just flawed like every other human being like me. Like he was flawed like me, you know, like uh, every, all of us are flawed. And when I realized it, really realized it, I let go of whatever I was holding yes. And it was easy. How could you, it's, I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to sit around thinking I'm going to forgive myself, forgive my father. It happened once. Understanding actually brings about the result. Understanding deeply that he was just a flawed human being. And I wished him, I'm sorry he suffered. I'm sorry for what he went through. And I just wished him peace and I wished him well. And I was able to say goodbye. You know, that's what it came from. It came from the understanding of his humanity. All right. So, but with a love yourself book, it's very focused. On, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you this um, about that you, you realize that he, he said, we are all human, so it's easy for you to forgive. Do you know if you are a hostage, what is the best thing you can do? Well, uh, show your feeling, show that you are human, oh. and then no matter how brutal are the terrorists, the robbers, when they see that you are still human, you have feeling, it's, 
it peace it it gives them peace it it changes their behavior it makes sense it makes sense um that makes a lot of sense yeah i mean it's like look that's how we actually connect with others too just re- if you realize your humanity you know um but like in the so that's one thing about forgiving others and i can't say i'm a perfect at it you know i've had people in my life that that i felt really wrong by that i had i don't think i've fully forgiven and i'm okay with it honestly it's not my job to go around working on that for like i'm okay i move on <laughs> you know like i'm okay with not being perfect at forgiving others does that make sense i've forgiven the ones i needed to that um and maybe the others will eventually will because it only holds me back and you know? after a time you realize i just don't care i just don't care about them you know uh and that's a beautiful way to feel actually the people that you held so gay that you get to point you know what screw it i don't care about you move on uh maybe that's forgiveness maybe it's not but i, I like it um yeah. but you know it's it's because it's it's look i very much focus on the inner big inner game like my inner game who am i going to be so like the self forgiveness was actually really important and it's it's i think it's key to loving yourself where you got to drop the weight you carry before you can actually start you know rewiring the uh, basically wiring the new patterns of love and it's a very simple exercise which i actually came up with a with an ex girlfriend now a girlfriend at the time and we drove out to uh south of Pat- from San Francisco to this this uh beach area called Pescadero is this very famous lighthouse there if anyone ever goes there it's beautiful you can watch whales it's just northern california coastline and we near there we hiked out we i think it's you know a lot of hop the fence you know hiked out um to where the cliff is by the ocean and, I, and then basically the exercise that came up was like look right down um i forgive myself the words i forgive myself for and then for something you're holding yourself and then do it again i forgive myself for i forgive myself for and just start doing it and start doing it. start doing it until you're so sick of it that you cannot co- forgive myself for not having coffee yes whatever until you get to that point right it just gets silly and but what you do, and then take that piece of paper and then read it loud to yourself the whole thing again and again until you're sick of you just realize this stupid weight you've been carrying all this time and you're sick of it and that reading out loud to yourself gets you sick of it right so this is important it's not just like writing it out through the sea and kumbaya this, this this is like an emotional it has to be an emotional experience and this will create the emotion and when you're sick of it you realize i'm done then ball it up go out throw in the ocean set it on fire whatever done it's gone and you actually do feel lighter it does work okay you may not you may still you will probably still carry some of it but a lot of it just notice you're lighter that's when you can like go on and do a vow to or a commitment to yourself to love yourself and move okay you've actually now dropped the weight of the past and what i do is with the vow for loving yourself now you give yourself a direction for the future right it's beautiful they just they just come in it's combined beautifully and the practice you can do it anytime you want like all of this is just you there's no right or wrong right as long as it works for you makes you feel good that's all the point just be right also later to like that that's when you wrote to yourself and you forgive yourself do you write also letters if you have a friend that you didn't behave as you would like do you also write letter no. to them no. just yourself if i have someone i have issues with and i can meet them and talk to them and tell them in person i will and move on if not life move on i mean if i really feel like i need to make amends i will but i think often people move on and you move on it's just move on you yeah. got a grand life to live not take that that hate all all the life with you yeah and leave yeah it. just move on and you know, the yeah, best thing yeah. is what well, the best thing is stop caring about it like like just give it up but if you really are carrying guilt or something like that or something the best thing you can do is you know go and say you're sorry you know it, it's a gift to yourself and to them right how they react or whatever is none of your business you you let it out but have writing letters to friends and stuff no like saying I'm, no i don't do that any of that um my friend 
who is also a chess grandmaster, and he read this uh-huh. book, your book, uh, earlier than me. After reading your book, he on my eyes and our all all on our eyes, he started to transform. And he wrote. He he told me. He wrote me a long letter, the longest letter I have get. Uh, longer that all the girls have sent me. <laughs> it was bigger, and uh-huh. he, and he told this that forgiving himself was one of the biggest things he could do because he didn't like himself, and just that he forgive himself. It took so much hate from there, and now his yeah. smile became so natural. So he was also asking me to uh, from him tell you tell thank you. For, for for just the chapter for forgiving yourself and myself I have done it some some maybe a year ago when I was so angry on my partner I just followed that time I didn't read your book I read from Jay Shetty I, re- I wrote that I wrote everything first I did everything on the laptop I wrote everything and instead of clicking enter I clicked delete <laughs> and mm-hmm. then I something was there i said like okay let's try to burn it so i wrote everything on paper i burn it and i felt how how yeah 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 that's yeah. that's beautiful uh, by the way I please was, tell your friend i said thank you very much that please tell him i said really thank you very much look as a writer i was like i work i work so hard at that book right i, I really give it my all i really really did and you did it's just you and the blank page right you face it every day and you have to create something of value, of true value in there. So I gave my best. But when you put it out, you, just, you don't know the effect. You kind of, I mean, I knew the power of what I put in there. But you still, you know, people have to take it and they have to apply it. Your grandmaster friend, he could have read it and said, oh, that's great knowledge and moved on. Right. And, right. He applied it. He did the work and he saw and he reaped the results. So it's, it's you know, it's beautiful. What a gift to me as the writer. That he actually applied the work and saw the and the inner trans. Thing is, the inner transformation comes naturally from it. You don't have to set out to say, "Oh, I'm going to be the person f- this way or forgive that way." Or, you just do the work, and it just it just happens as a natural result. And so it's beautiful. Please tell him I said thank you. Of course, I will do. He will be very happy. Um, come on. I found many beautiful chapters in your book. I loved very much the window chapter, how you clean the dust from it, mm. uh, how you light. And as I emailed you, yeah, I thought that my life is very bright. But after that chapter, I turned on the lights and it became even even lighter. Uh, that that is that is one of the chapters that that was so strong on me, and it is. I want you to help me to elaborate on that because that was one of the biggest things I learned that helped me for my chess. Uh, One smart person said to me, I was struggling a lot with negative thoughts. I am very angry after the game. Next day I have to play another game and I cannot get rid of my anger. And he said this, uh, with will you cannot get rid of your bad thoughts. With will you cannot get rid of anger. No matter how you try to that, I forget it. it, it will still come back. The only way is to nurture better thoughts. The only way is to think about beautiful things. And then the light, the bright will, will cover the dark, yeah? Uh, this is one of the things that helped me a lot with chess. So when people are blundering, it's one of the common problems in, for chess players. They blunder, they get angry at themselves, and they ruin all the game, even if they are still, they were winning. And then they ruin all the tournament because of all that negative thoughts. So tell me, please, about that window. How you, 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 you had that beautiful center about darkness. How the darkness you can only lead with light. With light, please tell me about it. I'm sure chess. Play, this will be have huge impact to all chess listeners, and not just chess listeners. Yeah, this was actually from a very wise friend who told me this. Which actually, what I think, because keep in mind, I wrote the book you know, so many years ago. And and I applied, and actually that's what I was doing when I was going to love yourself practice. He said, darkness is the absence of light. He said, you know, when you feel you cannot, if you're in a dark room, you cannot just fight the darkness. It will still be there. You cannot yell at it, scream at it. The darkness will still be there. 
He said the same with like negative thoughts. You cannot yell at them, scream at them. You cannot fight them. Their their darkness is the absence of light. He said what you do is you, you're in that dark room. You find the nearest window. You get your rag. You start cleaning that window. And light comes in and naturally takes the darkness away. So what I did was rather than try to fight all the negative thoughts I had about myself, and thank you for reminding me, um, you know, because I had all these negative thoughts, this severe negative self-talk, I just focused on that light. I just focused on the love for myself and that one thing, and it just took away the rest. That's the thing. I think a lot of us, we've never been taught that. We, we, it's a natural reaction to fight it, to will. As you, that's beautiful how, how your friend put it, you know, like you can't will it away. You cannot, right? It's a mind it's the mind wrapping itself around the mind. It's just not. What you do is you just open it up to the light. You open it up, and that just takes that. Just the darkness is, goes away. That's the only. That's the only way. And it's a practice. It's not. Not. It's not enough to have the knowledge. And it's. It's not enough to just do it once when you needed it. It's. It's it has to be a practice because it gets easier and easier, and it starts to run it. And it gets better. Because one thing I've learned is this rabbit hole. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. It's how far do you want to go down this, this rabbit hole of just creating an internally great state, right? And so you can always wipe the window better. You can always find new windows to clean, different different solvents, different rags, if I may use that. Um, but the ba very basic thing is, yeah, you cannot, um, yeah, like you said, you cannot will it away. It's beautiful. That's absolutely such a great way to put it. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one thing that uh, we talk we talk a lot with James. So we have to, I train him trust. He helps me with the business, and he, we talk a lot about philosophy and other things. One thing that we fundamentally I, we don't agree, uh, he, and we will not agree to you because I have read in your books that you don't really believe in happiness. You believe in fulfillment, uh, and he believes in well being. Uh, I am still romantic, maybe I'm still young, but I believe in that. And I found myself a way to clean the dust. Whenever it's dark, how I am cleaning, I found a way. Uh, and when I was going through your chapters, I was enjoying, I was feeling, I, there will be that chapter too, but there was not. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, that. Okay. So once we were at the table and there was a question, if you had one superpower, which it would be? And they, they were a different answer. I would be strong, someone said. Someone said I would love to fly and other thing. I told I would, I, my superpower I would love if it was I appreciate every detail because often I forget. Mm. I am grateful for things. I am grateful for my beautiful wife. I am grateful that I have uh, roof. I am grateful I have family. I'm grateful I have fingers. I am grateful I have legs. But often I forget them. Like, no matter how much I understand that, no matter how much I do morning gratitude things, no matter what I do, and I do it often, whenever it's something is going wrong, then whenever there is dark, I'm doing instead of nurturing with positive thoughts, I'm going to gratefulness. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for and try to do for everything. And this is my way. This is my way of cleaning the dust. This is my way of lighting the room. And this is the way it works for me. And I, th and I was thinking, if that was the, my superpower, if every second I was conscious how grateful I am, then I could debate with everyone that happiness exists. But somehow I cannot. But it's interesting. It's interesting though. You, you didn't use the word happiness. You used the word gratitude. Gratitude results in the happiness. You know, I, I think chasing happiness itself is is often uh, because that's modern society. You know, chasing happiness rather than chasing where for fulfillment, fulfillment for me leads to gratitude, which leads to happiness. You know, I think the state of gratitude is a very powerful state. I often like find myself going there. You know, it's very powerful. It's very powerful to feel it. It's amazing that you work on it. Um, and what a beautiful superpower to choose. I would have chosen something pedantic. Like, I would have chosen flying too. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> that is beautiful, man. Or big John Wick. <laughs> well, that's not a Zubar. That could be trained, you know? Uh, Kamal, are, are you familiar with Todd Herman and his alter ego uh, book and his thing? I, I've met Todd Herman, but I haven't read his book. Uh, have you ever in your life had alter ego? Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, so, like, uh, Kobe Bryant created Black Mamba, yeah, for him. And before before the game, he would make some routines and he would feel himself a Black Mamba. Uh, why ask that question? When I was reading your book, I felt at some point, maybe unconsciously, your your alter ego was Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Oh, that's funny. And you said, like, you would be proud. So maybe unconsciously you felt like, myself, I used it a lot. And there is, next to this room, there is a meeting room when I have meetings and there are different people there. Uh, now, the yesterday you were there too. So mm -hmm. how is that works? Like you two brothers, you and Naval were sitting there. The other part was uh, Ryan Holiday. The other part was Elon Musk. So I'm imagining that I'm and I'm talking to them. And then at the end, I'm coming with great ideas. So I'm, I'm just imagining that they are talking with me and it works for me. And Todd was talking, took, took that everything to another level when it's instead of I'm imagining that I'm talking to Naval or you and you are giving me advice, I'm just imagining that I'm Kamal. So I'm like, let's say I'm writing, yeah, and something is stuck. I'm imagining I'm James Altucher and then I become creative, something, something like that, yeah. So when I was reading your book, when you were down, you were in this, I love myself practice, I felt maybe unconsciously that image of rock. Ah. Uh. No, actually, the rock was. I just found him. I found him so inspiring. I find him very inspiring, like um, where he came from and his and his journey. But the pro the practice that you're talking about is very powerful. I've never done it, but I've read about it, and it comes from actually originally from what I've heard. This book called "Think and Grow Rich" by Napoleon Hill, where he came up with this concept of a mastermind, what he called a mastermind, and he would actually in his mind create a roundtable of what he of like. Einstein and Edison, and like whatever the greats were of his time that he thought, right? And they would sit together and, and, and to the point where he even got like, they would like argue with each other and all this other stuff. Like he really created this whole, like the round table and very realistic in his mind. And that's what he would use to problem solve and figure out life and what to do. And look, it's your imagination. It's your mind. Why not? There's all these untapped resources in our mind that we don't, uh, we don't use. All of these just tap into something, right? Deeper. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful practice uh, um, to do. To do. I mean, it's, yeah, I saw someone had created like an AI bot, the Naval AI bot that, that responds as you know talks to my brother. And I was, you know, so when I was looking at it, I'm like, that's definitely not my. I know my brother, right? Because he's my younger brother. Um, that's definitely not Naval. I don't think AI will ever replace him. But like in your imagination, that's powerful, and because you're. You're tapping into your perception of that person, but still going in deeper into your own inner wisdom. It's still coming from you. You know, that's power. We, we all have that, you know, and you're tapping into it. Um, I did read once that, um, and I thought, I thought, oh, this is really interesting, that Beyonce, uh, the, the singer, um, she, she started, she created the character of Beyonce. Because she was very shim timid and shy, right? Yeah, he was gospel singing. And she would create this character to step into it, right? And I think uh, I've even read that about Marilyn Monroe. And if you think about it, that's a great practice because it's a great way to overcome fear. You create this persona that it's not a persona based on someone else. And she was Sasha Fierce, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so you create this persona that's, the persona you want to be and then when it's time you just step into that persona and be that persona and you go through life with that persona and the situations when you need that persona that's a very i've never done it but i've thought about it that's a very powerful practice well um do you believe in the power of names that the names we are given it has some destiny in our lives uh funny my brother says that name is destiny do i believe in the power of names 
I'm, I don't see why not. I mean, I'm very fond of my name and what it means. And it's, it's, it has been a, it has been a thing. So, yeah. That's why I asked, yeah. It's, it, your, your name, Kamal, means Lotus, right? Correct. Uh, and it's, it's, it's your, you, you love that flower because how the light opens it, right? How even when it's so ugly outside, it's still the light opens it. And it's when I thought about that, that flower and looked back at your life, just only things I know from your books, it was so similar that often it was just you were dark, but you still opened. It were down, but you still opened. Interesting, huh? That's very interesting. That's very, uh, very insightful. By the way, this is probably one of the best interviews I've ever had. Seriously, it's a great conversation. I really, I'm learning. I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Come on, it's 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 it's. I couldn't believe that I'm going to talk to you. Uh, it's 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 my pleasure and myself right now. I'm so grateful for this opportunity, for you, for James who connected us, and this is crazy because I was just a kid in Armenia, some somewhere in the fourth country. Now I'm talking to people like you, uh, and one of the reasons I admire very much you. Your brother, as I said, yeah, it's not just successful, professionally successful, but overall, going with philosophy, winning your inner games. Um, Kamal, how do you harness your ego? Or another way, how do you keep your ego healthy? I read that word ego a lot in your books, dealing with egos. And Ryan Holiday's book, Ego is the, en 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 ego is the Enemy, is one of my favorite ones. How do you keep it healthy? That's a very interesting question. Um, I do what I do the practice I write about, you know, like I think an ego, having an ego is part is it's quintessential part of being human unless you're, unless you're, you know, awaken and are enlightened. But for those of us who aren't, it's the ego is what drives us, what makes her, makes us be great at things, what makes us accomplish things. So I don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah, I think it's when it it's turned against its, uh, you know, right? I mean, all our accomplishments come from that. So, like, like I'm not not I'm not I never I'll never knock it. It's it's uh, part of being a human being. It's all part of part of the game. Uh, ask healthy. How do you keep it healthy? I I learned it from James. I asked him how do you deal with your ego. He said I don't deal it. It's it should be there. I just try to make it to keep it healthy. It should be there. Just healthy ego. So that's why I ask this way, how you keep it healthy? Yeah, I use the word the mind. I don't, it, yeah, I use the mind. And I just work on my inner self. I've really come to, come to, at this point in my life, come to believe that it's the inner game that matters the most because it affects everything. We work so hard on the outer game. If we worked even a tenth as hard as the inner game, our lives would be very different. They're in much better ways. And including the ego being healthy, right? So I just, I just, do what I wrote about in the book. You know, I work on the various ways of the light or feeling, creating states within myself, feeling those states, you know, making them natural, feeling how good it feels and expecting my life to go that way, feeling the love for myself, feeling actually gratitude is one I've actually been doing a lot lately. I really enjoy it. Just like uh, sometimes I fall asleep at night, just feeling gratitude for all that is, but for also all that's coming, because I know it's going to, you know, I'm just going to start to expect good. Why not? You know, it's the opposite of fear, right? Um, and I think that's what keeps the, the ego healthy. It's that the, the ego, when it beats you up, is not is not healthy. But the, but the ego that feels good about you, feels good about what's to come in your life, feels good about what you're doing, that's healthy. And that's very doable. It's so doable. It just takes the inner work, and it's not hard work. As I said, I'm lazy. <laughs> you know, so. um, at the beginning of the year, I was, I was writing what I'm going to do this year, just like everyone does. Just with, I'm, I'm, when I'm writing it, I'm really getting committed to that. Just like you, I'm going all in. Uh, and I, I, I was a poker player, so I know how to put all my last chip on the table. So one of the things I wrote, 
and I took it to the first first line of everything I had. I wrote a win myself. Hmm. Tell me more. What, is, what did you mean by that? Um, I still I still had and still have some bad habits. I still want to feel gratitude more. I still want to create healthier ego. I still want to. There are many things I, I wanted to, and with that commitment, I realize how un, how often I do things unconsciously. Even the questions I might ask you, how do you how do you get healthy ego? Maybe I'm doing it's not my question. Maybe my unconscious asked that question because that was one of the things I committed to myself to win myself and. Now maybe it's better way to say after this talking to you to win the inner games that you described. Yeah, and you know, I don't think there's and I think it's a constant thing. It's not like you won and you're right. Yeah, and you're yeah, all good. that's exactly I that's realized important I to cannot keep in win mind. this this year. It's yeah, gonna be a journey. It's, it's a like it's a li- it's a journey, day. it's a lifelong journey. You know, yeah, that's you cannot just is. beat and okay, I'm the champion and I don't win it anymore. I did it. Okay, next, go, let's go to the next step. I realized right. that no, no, I need to uh, like get it better. Like, just even if not win, just get like win more, win more battles. And yeah, never it's you can never win it till the end. Yeah, until you get not become like enlightened or something. You, it's you know, still something a journey I've learned also, it's, it's also the language, right? Winning the battles, it's. Who are you battling? You're battling yourself, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. right. And I think in some ways it's not even battling oneself. It's just I've started looking at just how do I be better, right? Be better at this. How do I um, give myself the experience, inner experience that I that I know makes me better? So I've gotten away from like fighting myself. It's more just, it, this is actually like, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a choice of words, but it's actually there's a subtle shift there. You're not fighting yourself. You know, like if you fight yourself, you're still fighting yourself and you, someone, someone loses and it's the self. <laughs> so I think it's a more a matter of like, how do I just be better? How do I evolve? How do I be better? And then, then it's a constant, never ending journey, right? Because battles are won eventually. Right, wars I won eventually, like anything like that. But being better or growth or evolving, that's never ends. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 often at, at my at the end of my email, at the end, so when I write with best wishes, with love, GM over tick, at the end I have two hashtags. One is right mood, right move. So it's about mm-hmm. Focus on your mood, and the next one is my the word I created. It was it is kogro. Kogro means constant growth. So I put oh, right, really? right move and okay. kogro. And kogro is something I always keep in mind. It's like kaizen, yeah. It's like always growing. Yeah, always yeah, growing yeah, yeah, yeah. Kaizen and enjoying yep. and enjoying the journey. Yeah, and, and you know what? Oh, Even enjoying the journey happens. Sorry, do I play no, chess? Say the I, actually, no. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm smart enough to play chess. Honestly, I, everyone I know is chess. I consider way smarter than me. So, <laughs> one, one question I want to ask you. Uh-huh. So you have gone through a lot in your life. You have learned so much. You have met so many people, and your your whole life you had. Uh, so you've gone through so many startups. You created VCs. Uh, imagine now you are starting a chess. Imagine now you want to be as good as possible in two years. From your experience, from your life, what are the things you would take there and how you would start start your journey? Like you would do what? What would be your steps to become a better chess player? It's very interesting for me. You are not chess player, so all your life experience, what you would bring here and how you would do that? Well, first I have to want it. I have to be curious about it enough to go down the path. Otherwise, um, you will be lazy, that's right? Something in it captures, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, there's something about it captures my attention in a way like, oh, I need to be a part of this, this to be a part of me. And then what I would do is I would commit and I would find a master. And that, oh, here's the thing about ego. I, when, when I, one of the reasons I think my instructor liked training with me is because I have zero ego. I'm like, 
this dude has done stuff for those, you know, like it's a, he's a master, he's a modern samurai. I have zero ego. Whatever he says, I just do. Right? I would find a master and I would start off knowing I'm a complete idiot with this and I expect to be a complete idiot and I would just do whatever the master guys me to do and then just obsessively practice and learn. Let's keep the commitment, find the master and know there I have no ego. That is actually interesting. Like for the for the shooting with my instructor, I literally I think he 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 really enjoyed that because he's like you know he sometimes have a hard time training men because they have an ego about it, you know they have like a, they're like oh I can figure oh, I can do this whatever and they always like I have zero ego there, like whatever he says you know like I will do and I will apply and I will obsess on it and think about it to be better, so finding a master and then zero ego and just going. And I would just do that and do that and do that and do that. Beautiful. Kamal, so many people in the chess world are going through different journeys. I want to become international master, some grand master, some just got some, some rating points, yeah? What's the wish you have for them? Oh, what's the wish I have for them? Look, the wish I have for anyone, like when I was in the hospital room, I was like, man, I wish... I wish I didn't have to end up in a hospital to have that kind of honest conversation with myself about who I'm going to be and when I like, who am I, what I want in life. This, this is all this stuff of life. What I would just and like I've I've been down before, and what I learned from that is, look, in whatever journey we choose, especially if you're driven, you the more you take care of your inner self, the better the journey is, and ironically, the better the actual result is. What I would wish for all of them is to work in the inner being, their state, who they are inside to themselves, for themselves, by themselves, only for themselves. And the irony is they'll be better for it. The rest of the world will be better for it. Better for it. As you experience the people around them will be better for it. But do it for yourself. You're alive. You're on this journey. Make it better inside. Make it amazing inside. It's so beautiful what you said. It's so, so strong, nice, and beautiful, Kamal. Thank you very, very, very much, Kamal, for everything you shared with us. I am very grateful for you for coming and sharing all your wisdom. Thank you, man. Oh, dude, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. I really, really enjoyed this. And you're a new friend now, and I am looking forward to that barbecue. Seriously. I will make it with my own <laughs> I love great food. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Wow. If you are impressed, my friend, we are in the same stage in our brains. And I hope the time you spent with us will have impact on your inner game and your chess and life journeys will become more beautiful. To go deeper into this topic, I highly, highly recommend his book, Love Yourself like your life depends on it. Even if you don't do the love yourself practice, the book has such a nice message that it will brighten your life, even if it's already bright. I felt the light myself. Hopefully, you will too. I'm wishing you all the best, right mood, co grow, constant growth, beautiful journeys, and playing nice games on the chessboard and inside your soul. Stay awesome.